Hello, and thank you for tuning in. Um, today's lesson is going to be lesson six, and it's called God Sends His Messengers. God sends the prophet to call his people to repentance. Now, we're going to look at a group of prophets. Um, it's going to be about 16 of them that we're going to talk about from the Old Testament. And these are your writing prophets. There were some more, but these are the ones that uh, was written about. Um, the ministry was for the southern kingdom, which is also called Judah, and the northern kingdom, which is called Israel. And here's a list of the prophets. We have Joel, we have Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, Zephaniah, Nahum, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Obadiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And these are the 16 prophets in the, the written 16 prophets in the Old Testament. You may ask, why do we need a messenger? Why do we need a prophet? I can read for myself. I'll hear it on my own. But God sends the messenger. Now, our scripture, the memory verse, the golden text, is from Amos 3, 7. And it states, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to go on unless it's first revealed his secrets to the servants, the prophet. We're going to look at three points in this lesson. One is repent, repent and return to the covenant. The next one's going to be lack of repentance and is punished. Then the third and final would be hope for the future. Now, we're going to read some scripture. There's different scriptures because it's different prophets. So we'll be uh, jumping around just a little bit. It won't just all be one um, scripture as we normally have. So our first one is Jeremiah 3.11. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel have justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. And I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Then we got Joel 2, 12. Therefore, also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rent your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For it, he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Then we go over here to uh, Isaiah 9, 13. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore, the Lord will cut off Israel's head and tail, branch and rush in one day. Hosea 8, 1, set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Then we got Isaiah 11, 1. The, the tone is going to change a little bit. And therefore shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Ezekiel 37, 21, and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they, uh, whether they have gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them until their own land. 
And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be the king of to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. And then Zephaniah 3.14, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy, the king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. Praise God for his word. Now we're going to do the first part. It's called repent and return to covenant. And I'm just going to give you a little short definition of what is repentance. It's um, when you feel or express regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. Now, it's more than just saying, I'm sorry, forgive me. It's unconditional surrender to God as sovereign. It's a complete change in direction towards God. So it's not enough for me to just say, I'm, I'm not going to do it no more. It's a complete turnaround to go back to the Father and not to sin anymore. Now we have, uh, remember it says, return to the covenant. What is a covenant? What was the covenant between Israel and God? Okay. The covenant was an agreement between God and Israel because God promised to protect them if they kept his law and were faithful to him. And as you will, we'll see how things happen. Did they keep the covenant? Did they keep the law? We're going we're gonna to read about that. We'll start with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was both priest and he's a prophet, okay? He conducted his ministry in Jerusalem and Judah during the reigns of the last kings of the kingdom. Jeremiah lived in and near Jerusalem during the last spiritual, moral, and political revival of Judah under the reign of the godly king Josiah. Now, Jeremiah assisted jo uh, King Josiah in the beginning and then when he died, when King Josiah died, the reins went to his grandsons and his sons. But now when the reins went over to them, they did not keep any laws, any commandments of God at all. And so the, the, the providence, the, the kingdom there was evil. So Jeremiah pleaded with the kings, with the civil leaders, with the priests, and he pleaded with the people to return, return back to the covenant. Remember what you and God, the covenant you made. He's trying to get them to go back to the covenant they made, to repent so that they can be saved from the wrath of God. Jeremiah was one that kept crying out. He kept trying to get them to return, to forsake the evil, to forsake the idols, to forsake their other gods, and return to their first love, which is God. Um, Jeremiah reminded the people of Judah that the northern kingdom of Israel had already fallen to the Syrians as a consequence of their idolatry and wickedness. He's letting them know, hey, your brothers, the people you know, they already fallen. God's already taken care of that. You don't want to be like them. So he's giving them warning. You don't want to be like the, the, uh, the other side, the northern kingdom, because the Syrians has already come and taken them over. He's giving them an example of what could happen if you don't change. And then as I was reading this, I'm sitting here thinking, like, what does it take for someone to be convinced and to change? He gives them the example, okay, your kindred have fallen. Look what, look what happened to them. They didn't change. He's told them what could happen. They still went in their ways. Um, Judah had not learned from this to avoid the sins of Israel, but in fact, they committed worse sins than Israel. This was a warning to Judah to repent 
And the Lord commanded Jeremiah to also extend the invitation to the scattered Israelites, to the rest of them, to extend that invitation to return to the Lord. What causes someone to keep doing what they want to do? Do we still think we have time? Do we still think, ah, it won't happen to me? That's for them folks. That's for them over there. They're bigger sinners than I am. It can't happen to me. God is merciful. He's gracious. He won't destroy me. He won't take me out. He's going to keep giving me chance after chance, time after time. But we never know when God's uh, is going to stop, when his judgment's going to come. That's the warning of some of these prophets um, back in this time. There is another prophet. His name is Joel. He was always calling the people to repent also. Joel, he appealed to the people of Judah to repent and return to God. Joel's immediate concern was that a prolonged drought in the plague of locusts had devastated the land of Judah. And Joel preached that this was a sign from God that the people of Judah needed to repent and draw near to God. The drought was there. The plague was there. The locust was there. Devastation was in the air. Nobody still changed. So Joel is still pleading. This is a sign from God. He viewed it as a sign, a wake-up call to say, you need a turn. You need to do a complete change and return and renew that covenant that you have with God. They still did not change. Joel called on civil and spiritual leaders of Judah to sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people at the temple, sanctify the congregation. He said, let the priests and ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. Joel saw genuine repentance and the return of the people to their covenant with God as the only way out of the deadly natural disaster they were experiencing. This is the only way that Joel could see that they could escape the, uh, God's judgment was to weep between the porch and the altar and to cry out to God. This was their only way. And it kind of reminds me of what's going on now with the plague, with the virus, and people getting sick. Maybe the only way is to repent and to cry out to God so that this will stop, so that the plague was ceased. Now, there's a question that's asked in this lesson, and I'm going to read this question and give you a response on it. So you have these two um, prophets. you got Joel and Jeremiah. They lived in two centuries apart in different, and they ministered in different times, okay? But they both had one thing in common. They both called for repentance. Now, the question was raised, why is repentance always relevant? Why do we need to repent? They was calling for repentance in the Old Testament, and we're still today calling for repentance. Why? Here's a response to that. The people... Joel, meaning Joel and um, Jeremiah minister to, were called by God to live in relationship with him by faith and obedience under the covenant of the law given to Israel through Moses. We, as believers in Christ, we are also called by God to live in relationship with him by faith and obedience under the covenant of grace given to us through Jesus Christ. As the whole book of Hebrews in the New Testament teaches, we who, are, we who live under the covenant of grace have a better covenant with better provisions than the covenant of the law. Covenant relationship with God are repentance and faith and trust in God. We are under the covenant of grace by repentance and by faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Now, here's what happens when you're not listening, when you're not um, yielding, uh, yielding to the call, to what's being told to you. This next session is lack of repentance punished. Lack of repentance is punished. We're going to look at uh, another prophet. His name is Isaiah. He has something to say. Isaiah tells that he, uh, Isaiah ministered during the reigns of four kings. And while Isaiah was a prophet who lived and ministered in the kingdom of Judah, he did most, most of his prophesying was directed not only to Judah, but also to the kingdom of Israel. So he prophesied to everybody, warning everybody of the dangers of not repenting and turning back to Jesus. Now, during the lifetime of Isaiah, both Judah and Israel were in danger of being destroyed by the Assyrian armies or their empire. By means of godly leadership, the king Hezekiah and Isaiah, God saved Judah from being destroyed by the Assyrians, but the kingdom of Israel for refusing to repent was destroyed and ceased to exist. All they had to do was heed to the warnings and turn. It's hard sometimes to want to obey. You, there's certain things you want to do, certain paths you want to take. You don't want to repent right away, but be aware, as it was with Israel, when they didn't repent or they refused to repent, they was destroyed and ceased to exist. Israel stubbornly repeat, refused to repent. God's righteousness, righteous anger towards Israel was not turned away. He didn't let them slide that time. He didn't let it go. He was, it was not turned away, but his hand was stretched out still against them for all the evil they had done and for their refusal to repent. As it has always have been and is still today for those who refuse to repent and come to God for salvation, the wages of sin is death. And we don't want to experience that. All we got to do is turn. All we got to do is make that turn to the Lord. We're going to look at a couple of reasons what caused Israel, what caused their downfall? What caused them to just go the way, the direction that they did? Here's some reasons. And we'll start out with the prophet Hosea. Hosea ministered in Israel in the years immediately preceding the destruction of Israel by the Assyrians. Hosea hoped his prophesying, warning Israel of the approaching divine judgment for their sins would move them to repentance. That was his hope. He's prophesying. God is using him. His hope is that they're going to change. They're going to turn. They didn't listen before, but maybe now they're going to really do it. They're going to do it. But guess what happened? It didn't work. It, the prophesy went forth, but they did not receive it. They did not want to change. How serious does things have to get? How far do you have to go before you realize, hmm, I need to quit. I, need to, I need, really need to get back to my first love, which is God. I need to stop. My soul, my very existence is at stake. What will it take for me to listen? Now, here's some of the things that um, was a demise, okay? So the first thing was they had broken faith with God by transgression, transgressing. They kept breaking the covenant, the law of God. Remember what that covenant was. God would keep them. He would protect them if they would be faithful to him and they would um, live by the laws that he had set forth. He made that covenant. He's not breaking it. So the first thing they did was they broke that covenant that they had made with God. Now, the second thing they did, they had set up kings and rulers not chosen or approved by God. They just like, okay, we, we want this person as our king. No one consulted with God. No one consulted or asked the priest, nothing. They set up their own government. 
their own kings, their own rulers. They were not approved by God. Now, finally, here's another one. They had become so involved in idolatry and all its evils, and they would reap the destructive consequences of their sin. They went too far. They went too far. So you got the first thing, they broke the covenant. Second one is they had their own rulers not chosen by God. Then you got the next one is they got involved too much in the idolatry at that time. And for their consequence, they will be dispersed by the Syrians conquering them. So we can't keep disobeying and think there's no consequences because one day we got to give an account for our actions. We have to give an account. We just can't keep going on. Um, there's something that I saw, and I want to read this little part to you. I thought this was interesting. It says, we trivialize sin and forgiveness if we offer people forgiveness and salvation without returning requiring them to repent. All preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance, forgiveness of sins, and salvation from sin are all God's grace through Christ. Let me read that again. All preach repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Repentance, forgiveness of sins, and salvation from sin are all of God's grace through Christ, but we cannot bypass repentance on our way to forgiveness and salvation. Got to repent first before you can even think about forgiveness and salvation. After we are saved by grace, we live always ready to repent as we have need. So Jesus preached, repent ye all of you and believe the gospel. Now we see all that's happened. So we, we started out with uh, repent and return to the covenant. And then we started talking about what causes them to fall. And then we're seeing what happens, what, what led up to all of this. Now there is hope. There's some hope. So if you're a person, if something's happened to you, you broke your covenant with Christ, and you started going down the wrong path, there is hope. So our last... Um, part of this lesson is hope for the future there's still some hope now the destruction this is from um, Isaiah the destruction and demise of the ancient kingdoms of Israel and Judah was not the end of the Jewish people and God's purpose for them the prophets foretold of coming events that would be for the benefit of the Jews and all people now Isaiah had a vision Isaiah's vision of the Messiah's kingdom extended far beyond the time of Jesus' life on earth. Isaiah saw that a time will come when the world will be set right side up and one righteous ruler, the Messiah, over the nations. Jeremiah prophesied that the captivity of the Jews in Babylon it only lasts 70 years. The prophecies of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, were fulfilled when the post-captivity Jews occupied Persian providence of Judah. Now, their return from their captivity was foretold as we we'll look at the last prophet, which is Zephaniah. Zephaniah, a contemporary of Jeremiah also prophesied the restoration of the Jews from their captivity in, in Babylon and from their exile in the nations of the world. Zephaniah foresaw the restoration of the post-captivity Jews to their homeland and Jerusalem as a time of great rejoicing. That was such a time of them is born out of the well-known scripture um, and that's going to be found in Psalms 126. And I'm going to read this as we uh, get ready to close. So Psalms 126, 
Then the Lord brought back the captives to Zion. We were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it, then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O God, like streams in Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed of soul, will return the songs of joy, carrying their sheaves with them. Amen, and thank you for your time.